Welcome to ABC Tutorial. Today we'll talk about the electrocardiogram and its interpretation. The electrocardiogram or simply ECG is a simple diagnostic test which records the electrical activity of the heart on the graph. The heart is a muscular pump that pumps blood around the body. This pumping action of the heart is controlled by the cardiac conduction system. The sinoatrial node or SA node is the pacemaker of the heart and is the point of origin of the electrical impulses that propagate through the heart. The SA node is located in the right atrium and automatically generates an electrical impulse at the rate of 60 to 100 times per minute. These electrical impulses from the SA node initiate atrial contractions and then travel to the intraventricular node or AV node located in the interatrial septum. At the AV node, the impulse is briefly slowed before continuing down the conduction pathway to the bundle of ease. The bundle of E is divides into the left and right bundle branches and finally into the Purkinje fibers, which in turn stimulates ventricular contraction. During ECG, the correct placement of the electrodes is important as misplacement can result in misinterpretation and incorrect diagnosis. The common ECG is also somewhat confusingly called a 12 lead ECG, even though it only has 10 electrodes. These 10 electrodes allow the electrical activity of the heart to be viewed from 12 different positions, also called leads, thus the name 12 lead ECG. The 10 electrodes comprise of 4 limb electrodes and 6 chest electrodes. The chest electrodes are named V1 to V6 and are placed as follows. V1 is placed at the right sternal edge at the 4th intercostal space. V2 is placed at the left sternal edge, 4th intercostal space. V3 is placed midway between V2 and V4. V4 is placed at the left midclavicular line, 15 intercostal space. V5 is placed at the anterior axillary line, 15 intercostal space. V6 is placed at the left midaxillary line, 15 intercostal space. The limb electrodes are the left arm electrode, the right arm electrode, the left leg electrode, and the right leg electrode. The right leg electrode is a neutral electrode and is only present to complete the electrical circuits. It plays no role in the formation of the ECG itself. The 10 electrodes mentioned above produce 12 different views of the heart, also called 12 leads. The ECG leads are grouped into two electrical planes, the horizontal and vertical planes. The chest leads view the heart from a horizontal plane, while the limb leads view the heart from a vertical plane. There are six chest leads or views, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, and V6. These are unipolar leads as they only have one associated electrode. The positive pole is the electrode itself and the negative pole is the center of the heart. These leads look at the heart in a horizontal plane from the front and left side. Leads V1 and V2 look at the right ventricle. Leads V3 and V4 look at the septum, while leads V5 and V6 look at the anterior and lateral walls of the left ventricle. There are six limb leads which are heavy heart, heavy hair, heavy hair, leads 1, 2, and 3. The limb leads heavy heart, heavy hair, and heavy hair are also unipolar leads as they only have one associated electrode. For these leads, the negative pole is also at the center of the heart, and the three leads create a triangle known as the Hentoven's triangle. The limb leads 1, 2, and 3 are bipolar leads because they have two associated electrodes. Lead 1 gathers information between heavy air and heavy hair. Lead 2 gathers information between heavy air and heavy hair. Lead 3 gathers information between heavy hair and heavy hair. Leads 2, heavy hair, and 3 are called inferior limb leads because they primarily observe the inferior wall of the left ventricle, while leads 1, heavy hair, and heavy hair are called lateral limb leads because they primarily observe the lateral wall of the left ventricle. By combining the limb vectors, we can create the hexaxia system, which gives a perspective of the view of all the six of the limb leads. The information gathered by all the leads of the ECG are recorded on the graph as a tracing. The standard ECG paper speed is 25 mm per second, and one small square is 1 mm and represents 0.04 seconds, while one large square is 5 mm and represents 0.2 seconds. On the vertical axis, 10 mm or 10 small squares is equal to 1 mV when standard calibration is used. Positive voltages reflect as upward deflection on the ECG, while negative voltages reflect as downward deflections. On a normal ECG tracing, three waves are recognizable, that is the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. The P wave represents atrial depolarization, the QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization, and T wave represents ventricular repolarization. When interpreting an ECG, the first three things that should be assessed are the rate, the rhythm, and the axis. 
the heart rate can be calculated from the ECG using various methods. In most circumstances, when there is a regular reading, the simplest way to calculate the heart rate is by counting the number of large squares between the spike of each complex. These are the heart waves and this is called the heart rate interval. By dividing 300 by this number, we can get the heart rate. For example, in the ECG shown, there are 4 lakh squares between each R wave. Therefore, the heart rate is 300 divided by 4, which gives 75 beats per minute. Alternatively, we can count the number of small squares between each consecutive R wave and then divide 1500 by this number. For example, in the ECG shown, the heart rate will be 1500 divided by 20, which gives 75 beats per minute. The calculation of the heart rate becomes more difficult when there is an irregular rhythm, such as in atrial fibrillation. Under these circumstances, the rate can be calculated by counting the number of QRS complexes on the rhythm strip provided across the bottom of the ECG and then multiplying this number by 6. For example, in the ECG strip shown, there are 14 QRS complexes in the rhythm strip. This gives 84 beats per minute. In an average adult, the normal heart rate is taken to be 60 to 100 beats per minute. Bradycardia occurs when the heart rate is less than 60 beats per minute, while tachycardia is when the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. The best way to assess the ECG rhythm is by inspecting the rhythm strip. This is usually the 10 second recording from lead 2. The first thing to look at is whether the QRS rhythm is regular or irregular. This can be done by inspecting the rhythm strip and looking at the heart interval. The heart interval should be equal across the entire rhythm strip. If the rhythm is irregular, the next thing to be determined is if it is regularly irregular or irregularly irregular. An underlying regular rhythm can be made regular by the presence of extra six toes, also called ectopic beats. Once the regularity of the rhythm has been assessed, the QRS morphology should be inspected. The QRS complex is less than 120 milliseconds, that is, less than three small squares in duration under normal circumstances. If the QRS duration is greater than this value, then the rhythm might be coming from the ventricular myocardium. Having assessed the QRS duration, the rhythm strip and ECG should then be inspected carefully for the presence of atrial activity. As P waves correspond with atrial depolarization, this can be done by looking for the presence or absence of P waves. If there are no P waves present and the baseline is irregular with irregular R interval, this is suggestive of atrial fibrillation. If the rhythm is regular, the QRS duration and morphology is normal and there is a P wave present before each QRS complex, then the normal sinus rhythm is said to be present. The axis of the ECG is the average direction of the overall electrical activity of the heart. While talking about the ECG axis, it is generally the QRS axis that is being referred to. There are several ways of calculating the QRS axis, but the most common is the quadrant method. The quadrant method works by looking at list 1 and AVF. If we return to the exergia system, we can see how this can be used to look at the relationship between the QRS axis and these two leads. It can be seen that lead 1 cuts the exergia system in horizontal halves at 0 degrees and lead AVF cut the exercise system into vertical halves at 90 degrees. Therefore, these two leads can be used to divide the exercise system into four quadrants, and the QRS axis can be placed in one of those quadrants. The normal QRS axis is between minus 30 to plus 90 degrees. Left axis deviation is said to be present if the major QRS vector is between minus 30 and minus 90 degrees. Right axis deviation is said to be present if the major QRS vector is between plus 90 and 180 degrees, while if the QRS vector is between 180 and minus 90 degrees, the axis is referred to as extreme axis deviation or indeterminate axis. Combining this with the deflections in LED1 and AVF can be used to determine the ECG axis. If the deflections are positive in both LED1 and AVF, it is a normal axis. If the deflection in LED1 is positive, while deflection in AVF is negative, there is a possible left axis deviation. If the deflection is negative in lead 1 and positive in lead AVF, there is a right axis deviation. While if the deflections are negative in both lead 1 and AVF, there is an extreme axis deviation. After calculating the rate rhythm and the axis, the next step in ECG interpretation should be the evaluation of the wave segments at intervals. The P wave is the first positive deflection on the ECG. It is a small smooth contoured wave and represents a trial depolarization. Atrial repolarization is not usually visible as the amplitude is too small. The normal P wave is generally less than 120 milliseconds in duration, that is less than 3 small squares. The amplitude should be less than 2.5 mm in the limb leads and less than 1.5 mm in the chest leads. A normal P wave has a positive deflection in lead 2 
and negative deflection in lead AVR. The second wave on the ECG is the QRS complex. The QRS complex is a series of three deflections that represent ventricular depolarization. The QRS complex is less than 120 milliseconds in duration under normal circumstances. By convention, the first deflection in the complex, if it's negative, is called a Q wave. A Q wave represents the normal left to right depolarization of the interventricular septum. A normal Q wave is less than 40 milliseconds in duration, that is, less than one small square. It is less than 2 mm in amplitude and is less than one fourth of the total depth of the QRS complex. Small Q waves are usually normal, but if they exceed the criteria listed above, they are termed pathological Q waves and can be indicative of an evolving or past myocardial infarction. The first positive deflection in the complex is called an R wave. This is the largest wave in the QRS complex and represents the polarization of the thick ventricular wall. A negative deflection after the R wave is called an S wave. This wave represents the depolarization of the Purkinje fibers. The positive deflection seen on the ECG tracing following the QRS complex is called a T wave. T waves represent ventricular repolarization. A normal T wave is positive in all leads except leads V1 and AVR. It is less than 5 mm in amplitude in the lip leads and less than 15 mm in amplitude in the chest leads. Segments are usually isoelectric lines that are present between two waves. The PR segment commences at the ending of the P wave and ends at the beginning of the QRS complex. It represents the duration of the conduction of electrical impulses from the AV node to the bundle branches. The PR segment is isoelectric under normal circumstances, but deviation can occur in the presence of pericarditis and a trischemia. The other major segment is the ST segment, which commences at the end of the S wave and ends at the beginning of the T wave. The ST segment is also isoelectric under normal circumstances. And the most important causes of ST segment deviation are myocardial ischemia and infarction, with myocardial ischemia causing ST depression and myocardial infarction causing ST elevation. The PR interval commences at the start of the P wave and ends at the start of the QRS complex. It represents the time taken for the electrical impulse to be conducted through the AV node. It is between 120 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds, that is, 3 to 5 small squares under normal circumstances. The PR interval is prolonged in the presence of first degree heart block and is usually shortened in the presence of certain pre excitation syndromes. The QT interval commences at the start of the QRS complex and ends at the end point of the T wave. It represents the duration of time taken for the ventricles to depolarize and repolarize. The normal QT interval is less than 440 milliseconds under normal circumstances and tends to be longer in women. There are numerous causes of prolonged QT interval including electrolyte disturbances such as hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, and hypomagnesemia. Other causes of prolonged QT include hypothermia, congenital syndromes, and myocardial ischemia.